Summer, a river, Europe. These are the basic ingredients. And a river running through it. A river, exactly, running through a great European city. A, and a couple at the water's edge. These are the basic ingredients. The woman, young and beautiful, naturally. The man, older, troubled, sensitive, naturally. A naturally sensitive man, but nevertheless, a man of power and authority who knows this is wrong. They both know this is wrong. They both know this is wrong, but they can't help themselves. Exactly! They're making love in the man's apartment. <laughs> Doing what? Making love. Making love in the man's apartment. A luxury apartment, naturally. With a view over the entire city. These are the basic ingredients. A panorama of the entire city. The charming geometry of the rooftops. The skylights and the quaint chimneys. And beyond the TV aerials are monuments of culture. The Duomo of Florence and the arch at Les de France. Nelson's Column and the Brandenburg Gate, to name but four. The woman cries out, her golden hair cascades as it were over the edge of the bed. She grips the bed frame, her knuckles widen, there are tears in her eyes. The apartment is beautifully furnished. Well, obviously the apartment would be beautifully furnished. Obviously it would have high ceilings and tall windows and date in all probability date from the end of the 19th century when the rise in speculative building coincided with the aspirations of the liberal bourgeoisie to create monumental architectural schemes, such as I'm thinking particularly now, I'm thinking of the Viennese Ring Truss, which made such an impression on the young Adolf Hitler as he stood one morning before the opera. Or one of the great Parisian boulevards? Or one of the great, exactly, Parisian boulevards. And meanwhile, as you say, her golden hair cascades, as it were, over the edge of the bed. She rips the frame, her knuckles widen, and her pupils widen. While he... Let's say he grunts. Grunts? Let's say he grunts, yes, but sensitively. Let's say it's the sensitive grunt of the attractive man of power and authority. Not, for example, the coarse pig-like grunt of a mechanic lying on his back in a confined space trying to loosen a cross threaded nut with a heavy and inappropriately sized wrench. Absolutely not. Absolutely not, but the masterful grunt of a man who breakfasts on one continent and lunches on another, who flies first class with a linen napkin and a comprehensive wine list. That kind of man. That kind of grunt! That kind of light. What kind of light? The kind of light that streams in, it streams in through the tall windows, transforming their bodies into a kind of golden mass. A writhing mass!
the light, the golden mass. These are essential ingredients. But now, a look crosses her face. A what? A look. A doubt. A look of doubt! Yes! Doubt! Crosses her face! Ah. Even now. Even now. In the intensity of her passion. Even now, in the, the intensity of her passion, a kind of shadow crosses her face. A premonitory shadow. Premonitory? A premonitory shadow, yes, crosses her face. <laughs> Is that a word? Is what a word? Well, yes, of course premonitory is a word. Later. Night. The lights of the city at night. Strings of light. Suspended starlight along the quays and frameworks of bridges. A dull red warning lights pulsing on the tops of the power blocks and TV transmitters! The man at the telephone, his lowered voice, his trouble glancing. <laughs> Anne wakes up in the solid walnut bed, hears his faint male voice in the adjoining room. The exquisite Louis Quartz clock beside her chimes three by means of a tiny, tiny, naked gilt shepherd striking a tiny, tiny golden bell held between the teeth of an enameled wolf, no doubt a reference to the ancient myth well known to the 17th century French nobility, but now totally erased from human consciousness. Ting, ting, ting! 3 a.m. and wakes up. Hears voice. Light cigarette appears in doorway. Dialogue. Who was it? She says. Nothing. He says. Who the fuck was it? She says. End of dialogue. And now she's angry. Exactly. End of dialogue. And now she's angry. She's angry because she knows exactly who it is. His political masters calling him. His political masters! That's right! Calling him, just as they have always called him. The very political masters that she hates with every fiber, as it were, her being. The very men and women that she, and in her youthful idealism, holds responsible for the terminal injustices in this world. The leaders, who in their naive and passionate opinion have destroyed everything she values in the name of A. Business and B. Laissez-faire. In the name A. Of rationalization and B. Of enterprise. In the name of A so-called individualism and B of so-called choice, man. 
the basic ingredients, in other words, of a whole tragedy. A whole exactly tragedy unfolds before our eyes in Paris, Prague, Venice, or Berlin to name but four, as the moon, vast and orange, rises over the Renaissance domes, Bach palaces, 19th century zoos, and railway stations, and modernist slabs of social housing, exemplifying the dictum, form follows function. Form follows function! This whole tragedy of love. This whole tragedy of ideology and love. She stubs out the cigarette! She begins to shout! She begins to beat him with her fists. She begins to bite him with her teeth. She begins to kick him with her bare, wide feet. She beats and beats and beats. She beats and beats and the exquisite clock which has survived two revolutions and three centuries is smashed to pieces on the smooth and highly polished parquet that she beats and bites and kicks. The tiny tiny shepherd, the tiny tiny bell, both vanish. A rather nice touch, this. Vanish forever under the walnut bed. Until she stops for breath. Let's say she finally, shall we, stops at this point for breath. The woman? The woman, Anne, yes, stops for breath. And he bows his head. Yes. Looks up at her. Yes. Takes her tear streamed face between his hands. Takes Anne's tear stained face between his hands like a precious chalice. Or rugby football. Like a precious silver chalice, or as you say, a rugby football. Before drop kick, he takes Anne's angry, tear-stained face between his hands. He still loves her. For all their ideological differences. That's right. He still loves her speech. One day, Anne, he says, you'll understand my world. One day, Anne, you'll understand that everything must be paid for. That even your ideals must finally be paid for. End of speech, at which he smooths the wet strands of her hair from her lips and kisses her. These are the basic ingredients. Kisses her and presses her back down onto the bed or she him. But still, she passes him back down onto the bed and such is her emotional confusion distinguished between right and wrong. In this great consuming passion, the high ceiling apartment with the solid walnut bed polished parkway floor, the grand piano by Pile circa 1923. Without it should perhaps be noted an invisible means of the case of either against sexually transmitted diseases, including the so-called AIDS virus, more correctly known as the Human Immune Deficiency Virus, or HIV. A portrait of a young girl sketching once thought to be by David. 
but now attributed to his female contemporist, Constant Carpentier, and a triangular yellow ashtray with the legend Richard containing three cigarette butts and a quantity of fine grey ash. A great tragedy! In other words, of love. A great, exactly, tragedy of ideology and love. These are the basic ingredients.